Welcome to Law and Justice. I'm Jane Mulcahy, and this is a special series on the topic of how to talk policy and influence people. Today, I am so excited to be joined by Erin Connolly, who is a social worker in the States, in Philadelphia, is that correct? Erin? I'm right outside of Philadelphia, but I've spent most of my life in the Philadelphia area, yes. Okay, well, thank you so much for getting up early on a, on a Saturday to talk to me about trauma and ACEs and, and your important work. Um, I'm delighted to meet it's you. I, me too. I'm so excited. And it's amazing how the, the Twitter world, right, gets us connected. Right. I, yeah. I've met all my best people recently <laughs> through Twitter. So uh, you, you're you're a new one and I'm, I, I'm really delighted. But before we get stuck into the topic, Erin, maybe you can tell me a bit about yourself and your background, please. Yeah. So um, I guess the, the first thing I identify is and, you know, why I'm super excited to be chatting with you is, you know, I'm a daughter of an Irish immigrant. Um, and uh, I've been practicing social work for over 20 years, mostly in trauma impacted communities, children and families. Um, I'm currently a school social worker and I have a private practice um, that I mostly work with um, adolescents and young adults. And everybody's pretty much, they've had some kind of trauma in their life. So that's where I'm at right now. Okay, and um, when did you kind of first become interested in adverse childhood experiences and trauma? Was it something that you, I suppose, if you're working with um, children and young people and families, then mm -hmm. it's hard to, to not see it. it. It's probably ever present, but when did you maybe learn more about the ACEs science and the neurobiology and, 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 and the impacts of embodied trauma and that type of thing, Erin? Yeah, so that probably, I would say in the past 10 years is that I really dove into that. Um, you know, part of why I got into social work was based on one of my own traumas. I had some medical issues when I was a teenager and I ended up at a hospital and I witnessed a child dying. And so my, my, my goal was to become somebody that could work in a hospital and make sure that no other child, no other, you know, child got to, had to experience witnessing somebody die and, you know, not knowing what was going on and understanding that. Um, and I did just that. I went back to there 15 years later and I got to experience um, working with every possible population of children that you could imagine working with. And it was through that work, especially in the, the medicine world, um, you know, asking a, a patient or a parent, what is, you know, what, what was your trauma using those words mm. didn't go too well because I didn't get, <laughs> I didn't get any information. Right. So, okay. I learned very quickly to say like, you know, did you have any major life events, any stressors? And then it all came out. So, right. and a lot of people don't identify with the word trauma. Okay, you know, that's um, the, other people. That's more right. serious and out there. Right, right. So, and I think, actually, I think there's a lot of people that don't say, you know, unless it was like a car accident or, you know, um, a violent act that they don't think that they've had, you know, been exposed to what we call trauma. Mm -hmm. And as far as the ACEs, um, I think, you know, when I learned about ACEs, I, I, I was really excited that we had some knowledge to say like, hey, let's talk about things that are happening to people because of something they experience versus, oh, you had that experience, um, we're just gonna treat it this way, but not diving deeper into the, mm -hmm. to the actual experience. Um, and then you talked about the, you know, the neurobiology. So I went from learning about ACEs to uh, just really studying through experiential um, mm -hmm. work. And then um, I had the opportunity to train under, um, as a clinician with um, the Neurosequential Model Therapeutics. And oh, wow, Care. okay. Yeah, I'm actually supposed to be recertifying right now. Um, you know, I, my certification ran out, so I have to recertify, but it really, made the connection for me for the brain and mm -hmm. how our and the brain is, you know, we know so little about the brain, but there's so much connected to the body. Mm -hmm. And my practice is while we want to talk about, you know, ACEs and neurobiology and all that, as a social worker, I'm not having those conversations with right. my clients, my patients and those people. So I have to learn how to interpret that work and make it digestible. Okay. So yeah. And I, and I think I mentioned to you earlier, I'll go off on tracks and tangents. That's okay, like so do I. A lot of good stuff. <laughs> a lot of good stuff. So just, just bring me back or call me out yeah, on it. <laughs> no problem. 
So um, then when you are working with your clients, you have that in the back of your mind. You have all this information, but you're, you're um, not necessarily quizzing them about or trying to educate them about how these things might be impacting them necessarily. Absolutely not. So I think that, again, as social workers, um, it, we have to really find the way to be um, balance art and science okay. and, and f figure out ways to, um, to get to the core of somebody and really see where they're at so that we can guide them or support them, not help them necessarily because um, helping is, it, it sometimes can be misinterpreted as you know, a form of control. Right. Like it's, about, it's about us, not about them. Mm -hmm. So how do we guide them with their permission and how do we support them? You know, again, with permission to say like, how do we get you to the next step and seeing your best self and acknowledging that the trauma or the life experience that was so stressful happened and how do we move forward with that information in our body? Do you think that we ask, um, and I'm not a, a practitioner, I'm just a researcher, but do you, so when I say we, I mean um, humans in general, but, but certainly, um, I suppose, human service providers, do we ask people enough what do they actually need? That is a great question. Uh, and I think about that one and, you know, not to speak for other human service providers, mm -hmm. but for myself, um, I can say in the beginning, no, I didn't, you know, and it took, you know, till now, 20, 20 some years later to, to be able to see that it's, you know, really finding out what, what is it listening, questioning, not, not, not necessarily and being very curious Yeah. versus just assuming and yeah. And you, well, you know, we talk about policy and 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 systems. We, as I really can only speak for our nation, but it's it it. There's a sense of control and power, and thinking that we know what's best for everybody, and mm -hmm. it's not the case. Mm -hmm. so, yes, yeah. and of course, um, well, I only uh, I can only again think about myself and put myself in someone else's shoes, and imagine that sometimes the systems are just not getting what what we're really going through maybe or that if we're, we're in a current life threat then thinking through the consequences maybe beyond us from the the neurobiological point of view you know we're mm -hmm. in survival mode and systems yeah. i think don't maybe still quite get that um although in the states there do seem to be a lot more moves to um, become ace aware and trauma informed or responsive and some at least are doing the um, neurosequential model of therapeutics in various settings um, mm -hmm. and does does that though then help with your own individual practice like how how does say training and something like the N nmt help you as a social worker um, it helps me, you know, understand that part that I talked about science and art. So science okay. and the science is really looking at how the brain, you know, functions from bottom up as, you know, Bruce Perry's model and many others models. Um, and like you talked about being kind of in that stuck position of fight, flight, freeze or fawn or whatever we're, you know, term we're putting to it these days, but it's stuck in the bottom part of the brain and we're just surviving. Mm -hmm. And how do we how do we get to a place where we can teach people to thrive? Right. So, and getting them connected so that they, they can fully understand what is happening to them and around them. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's necessarily answering your question, but I think that that's for me and my practice um, is just really getting to know somebody. Mm -hmm. And I tell my clients that my individual clients, I'm like, you know, we're not going to dive into the therapeutic stuff just yet, but I am doing therapeutic interventions just mm -hmm. by building a relationship. You yes, know, and I think that's a lot of what you know. As clinicians, we tend to do is we're like, it's almost like a Jedi mind trick sometimes. It's like, <laughs> okay, we're you know, but it helps us figure out like what what are the next steps? What can we yeah. offer you to support? Well, I was I, I'm glad you mentioned the relationship there because that's one of the things that I've learned is crucial. No matter what you're doing, whether it's social work or psychology or psychiatry or just being a teacher. Um, the relationship is front and center. And if that's off, or if you don't re realize its centrality, um, and I suppose if people feel you actually care about them, as opposed to you're trying to control what they do, right. um, they feel that. And, and, and maybe, 
do you think trying to establish safety in relation in, in a relationship for people is important and, and is it challenging? Absolutely. And, you know, um, with with the when you study um, as a social worker and then you take these exams and, you know, one of the, the number one things that we have to do is establish safety, you know, not just physical safety, but emotional safety. Um, and uh, is it difficult? Absolutely. Um, you know, it, in, uh, I guess one of the, the things that I think about with safety is um, I don't know what the other person is truly going through. Mm. So I don't know what their safety factors are. What do they consider safe? What do they not consider safe? So I do my best and, you know, try to figure it out. And especially with crisis, because when I worked at a hospital, um, even now working in schools, like there are crises that come up and you're like, okay, you got to think fast and figure out ways to make people safe, not only physically, but again, emotionally. And I think that's the biggest thing, especially with our mental health, you know, crises that are happening. And um, especially with the virus and the pandemic, I think we're seeing more of that than we ever have, um, you know, but anyway, I could go off on a tangent about that part too. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I did um, polyvagal theory training with Stephen Porges a while ago. Mm -hmm. And what I found so fascinating about that was his whole thing about we need to feel safe in our bodies around other people. And of course, lots of trauma ruptures that, you know, if we're abused or neglected in the home or maybe even attachment was lacking, that we don't have that essential inner trust with people. So that even when we think people are safe, like, even if it's a lovely school and we presume everyone feels safe there, well, lots of people maybe don't because they're on high alert or whatever. Mm -hmm. And of course, with COVID, none of us feel safe around each other, really, you know, because we know we're germ buckets and um, it's it's very uh, destabilizing and we're not getting our social and emotional needs met, any of us, really. Not at all. And, you know, I work in an elementary school and um, the social emotional lessons was like Mm -hmm. my biggest thing that I wanted, you know, I can do all the resourcing and the the crisis stuff all day long but I'm like you know what for my own preservation Mm. and for these children and for the teachers I'm bringing in social emotional lessons and they have to be engaging because even if it's for five ten minutes like yesterday I taught um or this past week I taught uh, a lesson around kindness and then I taught about um the there's a meditation called love and kindness meditation so I taught that too and it was amazing to see these little kids like kindergartners, first graders, second graders, be like, they're looking around. They're like, I don't know what to do with myself, but they're, but some of them were just hands on their heart, eyes yeah. closed. And it was, they were able to regulate, but then the other ones that weren't, and maybe they still did get a little bit of regulation. They just mm-hmm. weren't showing it in their bodies. What yeah. a great thing to have though, in schools, to my knowledge, we don't have anything like that. You know, we don't have school social workers, for example. And um, is, is that a typical thing? Do all schools have social workers or, or does it depend on the type of school or the need yeah. in an area? Yeah, so it, it's, um, it depends on the need. Um, our, our city schools tend to have more social workers. Um, the suburban schools are getting social workers more often. Um, social workers, you know, often in the history were, were thought of just people that were caseworkers that dealt with child abuse or dealt mm-hmm. with, um, resources and uh, referrals. But um, when you have the degrees here and different licenses, we can do therapeutic work and which is really cool and it's it's exciting. So, um, you know, I I think that part of it is that education, you know, is is usually pretty regimented in what they wanna get done. And uh, as as, as the information and science continues to grow and the research grows, we know that children need to, you know, there's a, there's a saying about um, Maslow before bloom and yeah, basically like have this. to deal with all yeah. the, the needs of, you know, their home environments, their communities, their, their individual lives, their family lives. Like there's so many pieces that need to be dealt with because if they can't deal with that, we're not working in the front part. We're not learning. Yeah. So, yeah. so it's the important. The upstairs brain is there. offline or whatever. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so it's How really exciting and very important work. Um, so I discovered you on Twitter after um, I was online and looked up the campaign for trauma and foreign policy and practice, and then possibly Sissy White tagged you in a tweet or yeah, something. Yeah, I can't quite yeah. remember. 
but um, I've become really interested lately in, in trauma-informed community building and engagement. And um, your CTIP biog concludes with this cool statement. Erin is an unwavering advocate for creating communities and systems of care that promote whole being wellness and strengths-based services for all. Erin, how do we go about realizing this great vision? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Doing it and talking about it are two different things for me. Um, so I think one of the biggest things is, is really understanding systems, how they work. And I like to consider myself and being part of the CTIP board and um, which it stands for campaign trauma informed policy and practice. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I was working with um, one of the, the, the um, policy people and he's like, you know, you got to get in with our policy group because I always had this like energy and urge to advocate on higher levels. Um, prior to the work I do now, I was an early childhood advocate for okay. early childhood education. So I would go to the Hill, you know, in Pennsylvania or um, down in DC and I'd be like, you know, for every dollar you spend, you get a return investment of seven to $17. Well, nice. tra trauma, yeah. we don't have those numbers. And yes, it's okay. really hard. It's really hard to make yourself, right? So, which is another part of social work, right? We, we, we tend to have to sell. Yeah, <laughs> you know, try to quantify. To, right, get yeah. people to buy in. And it's absolutely asinine, but it's, and it's what helped, you know, that's what keeps social workers so undervalued is that when we have to sell that stuff, instead of just being like, you know what, this is a human interest. Mm. It's a human need. Um, so anyway, I was, uh, Dan was um, saying, join our policy committee. I'm like, eh, yeah, that's fine. Great. Um, you know, policy is great and everything, but I would want to be, I want to make sure we're incorporating the grassroots level information. So I was able to find an opportunity that I could be a bridge between the policy and the practice. Um, and I, I mean, I got to work with some amazing minds and brains. Um, more recently, I've removed myself from that particular committee just because of my schedule but I still get to be part of it. And it is um, being part of the CTIP as a whole is just a bunch of brain power mm -hmm. around the table. And, you know, um, there is a lot of movement that I'm hoping, especially with our new administration that's coming in in January, that we can start to, to, to get our voices heard and really implement a lot of the work that is happening um, on the ground. So, yeah. And, and um, so I've been following uh, as part of my research, obviously ACES Connection, because it is very grassroots and it's a great, um, easy to, to digest repository of information and various networks and communities who are trying to build ACES forums or I suppose collaborations um, mm -hmm. of, of trauma-informed practice and that type of thing. Uh, are you aware of some of, of these kind of cutting edge movements in your neighborhood or further afield? And what are the central points that you think are, are, are important to consider for any community uh, that wants to set up a trauma-informed community focus, Erin? Yeah, so um, prior to my work at the school district that I'm in now, I was actually um, running a trauma initiative uh, for United Way. So you, I don't know if you're familiar with United Ways, but you know they are uh, organizations that, um, again, bridge public, you know, private uh, monies and dollars and connections and collaborations, nonprofit, for profit, and um, that's where I really got to see like how do we build this? You know, how do we, it was already started a little bit in the different communities and um, at at the United Way, I was there was there were five counties in Pennsylvania that included Philadelphia County. Um, and a couple counties in New Jersey, but it was bringing everybody together. And there was one particular county, which I actually work in the school district now, and it was looking at the sectors and who do we bring together. And it started off with nonprofit, social service, education, you know, all the usuals that show up to the table for collaboration. And um, I got to attend the trauma conference. I don't know if it wasn't last year, it might've been the year before. And there were people from the business community, people from law enforcement. And I was like, this is my party. This yeah. is my party. <laughs> I wanted to hang out. And one of the really cool things, and I, I tell you the story is because it is showing the bridge that's happening yeah. is that I got to meet a, a, a guy from the construction world. Okay. And 
and he is so invested in trauma and he's trying to figure out how do we, you know, as the trauma world, the, the people that are doing the practice of, you know, informing people about trauma, about ACEs, about practicing around social systems and, and networks, um, how do we really engage the for-profit world, the, the, the people that are the business, the corporations, and also too, is that, you know, this, this affects everybody, yeah. anybody and everybody. And I, when I, he was in the same like session I was in, he talked about something and I'm like, I'm get, finding him and, <laughs> and we've become, you know, good friends. And I'm just like, you know, he's, he gets it. And I'm yeah. like, oh my gosh, we found that gem in the, you know, the, the pile that you're just like, where are these people that get that ACEs and trauma and it affects everybody and anybody. So how do you do that in a community? You just have to find your gems. Mm. And the people that are the energized and and really hold on to them and and find ways to help support them get through that because I mean for like even listening to you and talking about you know hearing I mean we've only known each other for a couple of weeks but like it's amazing I the people that you're connected to on Twitter and the amount of trauma work you would think there was more trauma work in the Twitter world that's happening in the UK than versus here I'm like I see more people on Twitter that. <laughs> You know, and um, Dr. Karen Treisman. Amazing, and, yeah. Right, and I got to, I got to, she was actually at the conference that I was talking about. Okay. I got to have lunch with her and she's so lovely. And I'm like, it, it just, I get so excited that, you know, I lose my words sometimes around this, but it, it can happen. Um, it's just finding that passion and energy to the people that are interested in it right now. And then trying to sell it, trying to get people to buy into it by, by, you know, that connection and that relationship piece, like finding that one little thing. Why is this person from construction interested? Because his staff turnover yeah, you know, and all the stuff that's happened to them, like we want to keep our, our businesses growing and we can only do that if, you know, we pay attention to people as people. Yeah, it's so interesting, but it, it, it strikes me as in some ways very, very believable. And obviously it happened because like Sandy Bloom, who's on your seat to board as well, who I love, her, her book, Creating Sanctuary, um, talks about how we live in a trauma organized world, really. And, you know, she, she's, she's talking about America, but it's not just America. And, and a lot of men, of course, in the States have combat histories. And so some of those might be in construction sites or, you know, whatever adversity and trauma is common. So it, it, it manifests in workplaces too. Yeah. And, and, and people get sick and they get depressed. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. I was going to say Sandy, I mean, Sandy is like, you know, Sandy is our rock star, our guru <laughs> in the area. Um, and, you know, I actually was chatting with her that I was going to be speaking with you. And I told her, I said, didn't you do some work in Northern Ireland? She's like, so she has done. And yeah. there are, there are sanctuary, you know, like communities in Ireland that I know of. Um, mm. And it, she just gets it. And, you know, it, it, it is, it's like, we are set up to, to, to keep surviving and pushing through these traumatic experiences, these life stressors, rather than trying to find ways to cope, heal and thrive. Yeah, but I think what's interesting is like that the, the um, say the trauma movement is not new either. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's from at least the 1980s kind of once PTSD was recognized and then Judith Herman's work on domestic violence and rape and all of that and we've gradually people working in the field like Bessel van der Kuh, and loads of people have been talking and Sandy um, but this focus on communities is much newer I think in in kind of looking at how we all regardless of what we do in the world and no matter where we live um, we have a role to play actually in supporting and buffering one another. And I don't think we still quite get that. Mm -hmm. um, and so the focus, I think, mainly on the community building is on more deprived communities, maybe, you know, with more complex social problems, um, low collective efficacy, and maybe in the States, the legacy of racism and all of that, mm -hmm. that makes it very hard to thrive. But I think the challenge there maybe is that people are a little bit shut down as a group and mm -hmm. like putting up your hand and saying, yeah, I'd like to volunteer or what can I do is hard, you know? Right. So do, do we need community activists 
um, like probably they are, I know they are in various communities getting involved in this, but um, is training a key thing? Is it the inf bringing this information, like, you know, the ACEs evidence? I think that's why it's powerful, is it, it's mm -hmm. simple and digestible and a conversation starter. And like the Resilience movie um, and your other colleague, Laura Porter from CTIP, yeah. Uh, one of my favorite lines from Resilience is hers about something along the lines of if we bring this information or this ace of science into the hands of ordinary people, they'll create wise solutions. Do you think yep. that's true, Erin? Absolutely. Absolutely. You said so many things right now. I'm like, oh, yeah. OK, so there's so, there's so <laughs> many pieces to all that. Um, going back to what you said earlier about, you know, uh, the people that are tired, hmm. right? And you know, uh, talking about the states here, and especially around racism and um, other prejudices, and you know, uh, you know, the LGBTQ communities. The the I, there's just so many pieces to to oppressed and marginalized groups. Um, and I, as a white female, I am now more than ever i'm like it's it's people like me that need to be speaking up and getting and figuring things out it they, too tired they've done so much work and you know as the as the people that are you know i can't think of the right word but just connected to the people that were the oppressors mm. you know just based on my my physical body and yeah. you know is is um you know those are the conversations we need to be having they're so hard to have but people need to learn to be uncomfortable. The people like me need to be uncomfortable. Um, so with that, but also the training piece, right? Giving that information and saying, how does, what does trauma look like? What do ACEs look like in your body, in your mind? And, you know, if you want to get, if somebody's, you know, just really based on like books and facts versus the experiential piece, um, you know, just being able to have all that gathered information and data available to people and, and picking and choosing, you know, where they connect to so that they can grow their mindset and, and decide like, okay, this is the route I'm going to take in part in my part versus, mm -hmm. you know, being told to be like, Hey, um, you're an organization, we're bringing in a trauma training. And I can't tell you how many times I've gone into organizations, you know, it, it, part of my role at the United Way was providing trainings, was supporting and funding trainings. And, you know, there were people um, actually, you know, I would say the law enforcement world. Right. None of that landed with them in the first couple of times. They had to revamp the training so that it could connect to them. It still right. doesn't always land, but it's, it's, a, it's a work in progress. And yes, it has grown in communities. Um, there's still so much more to do. Mm. Yeah, well, it's a long journey. I think everyone agrees about that. It's a process. And um, I like as well the, the phrase that some people have used, including Jim Sporliger from the Paper Tigers movie, mm -hmm. the teacher from Walla Walla, that really it's essentially a way of being. But the information helps you change your way of being, I think, and mm -hmm. helps you. Um, it certainly helped me understand bad behavior. Um, mm -hmm. And, and, and even challenging things in myself, you know, or my own responses that you look differently and kind of go, what's really going on here? Yeah. Uh, and and, and um, also just the thing about a dysregulated person, an adult does not help a dysregulated child or two dysregulated adults are not going to uh, have a happy sort of um, outcome from that interaction. But um, just moving on slightly, the the um there is some criticism of particularly aces um in in ireland and the uk and further afield and it's one thing having this information but then there's another what do we do about it mm -hmm. and um applications or screening and that type of thing but some of the most extreme or trenchant criticism in in this corner of the world has come from social workers and social science mm -hmm. and um I'm just wondering, is, is this the case in the States as well? Is there a backlash from, from your field? And if there is, what, what do you think that might be about? I can only speak to you know, the communities that I've worked in and the social workers I've worked with. Um, I do think that here, the ACES um, information was a good starting point. Okay. But I totally agree with the idea of, do I wanna, and I was kind of on board for a little bit, like let's do the ACEs screening in a doctor's visit. Mm. But as I 
grow, grew in my practice and my own understanding, it didn't make sense because it, there are 10 questions that don't apply to everybody. Mm -hmm. We need to build it out a little bit more. And that's why I love, you know, Wendy Ellis's um, pair of aces that, that, that looks at things in a, in a bigger, broader way. It's not to say that the aces, the original aces isn't a, isn't a really great tool. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a good starting point. Mm -hmm. um, but I do believe that, you know, and if you're, we're, we're talking about policy and everything else is that we have to have things for the action piece, you know, now what, yeah. now that we've got that information and they got an ACES score based on the original score of like seven or 10, you know, it, and when are we conducting these ACES screenings, you know, yeah. cause are we doing it when they're 17? Are we doing it when they're 60? If they're 60, they've already lived, you know, 60 years worth of, of stuff that wet that maybe they tried to undo or try to shift in a different way so that they could survive and thrive. But um, yeah, that's the, the million dollar question is, you know, what do you do next? And I think as a social worker, um, it's literally uh, based on person to person and community to community or families. Um, and I'm curious to kind of come back to you and ask and say like, what, what are your thoughts around why social workers? Cause when I think social workers, I think you know, social workers are a, 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 an amazingly unique profession, um, professional group, because we don't just look at one thing and narrow in. We really have to look at so many different things. I mean, that's what we're based on as social workers. We're looking at systems. We're looking at individuals. We're looking at micro, macro, mm. meso, everything. Mm. So I'm curious as to the social workers that, you know, you're, you're, you referred to, like, what do you think that's about? And well, I I think um, the major criticism of the original 1998 10 ACEs is the lack of poverty and the lack of um, wider kind of social determinants of health stuff yeah. around poor housing, you know, food insecurity. Um, also, then some of the backlash um, uh, can be around atta the attachment issue, you know, or um, some people have said it's a bit of mother blaming or early years determinism. Mm. Some people just don't like the idea that our, our not to threes really can define or, or, or if not define, um, predispose us maybe to poorer um, health, behavioral and relational outcomes. And mm. I understand as a mother, some of it is actually quite frightening. The stuff around the, um, the first year of life, I think if we're unsupported, um, that's the a big issue for me is we just now know that healthy maternity and low levels of stress in mm -hmm. in families and for for children and moms are crucial mm -hmm. and and to me it is what are we doing then to support that but I think um like the the WHO ACE IQ is much broader it it in, includes discrimination and community violence and all sorts of things but Stephen Porges as well says um really the event is not so much the issue it's how our body responds to the event mm -hmm. and so and the, and then Bruce Perry says the nature timing and um intensity of the events is also crucial so it is a bit crude, I guess, the, the, um, the original ACEs study, but I found it personally a brilliant conversation starter. Mm -hmm. And I've met people with high ACE scores who kind of go, wow, yeah. that explains a lot of my issues. And then they find it kind of liberating. Mm -hmm. So, but the, the, the big question is what do we do with it now? I, I do think, how, how can we best apply it safely? Right. <clears throat> and I mean, yeah, you, you, you it, that's exactly what it is. Yeah. It's how do we apply it safely? But, um, and it is such a good converse, conversation starter. And I think that was, you know, one of the big pieces that was the conversation starter for the movement, at least in the States mm -hmm. and making these communities happen is, you know, we can keep looking back at the ACEs. Um, you know, there's, uh, there was an urban ACEs um, done in the Philadelphia area by Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, pediatrician, um, you know, that looked at, things around, you know, in the urban community. So not just in, you know, suburban America. And, you know, that was, I think a good piece, but I think I'll go back to what I said earlier about for me, for as a social worker, there's a balance or at least a, a weaving of science and art. Mm -hmm. And I am very eclectic in my practice. I will pull from many different things. Um, I don't focus on just one, you know, sure. way. 
it yeah. doesn't work for me. Um, and we know that it doesn't work for many people um, when you're, you're, you're trying to work with them. So, um, you know, pulling the, the eight, just knowing the aces in my head, I can say like, hey, you know, did you ever experience um, violence in your household? Okay. And then also too, you know, um, what did your community look like growing up? You know, like getting to different questions versus um, just kind of saying like, I'm told to do this. Mm. That's just not how I work. Like I'm going to be creative. And that's the, I love so much is because there's a piece of me that I am, and this is my ADD or my ADHD, whatever you want to call it <laughs> is, is the creativity piece. Right. Like I have to, I have to be able to express and explore my creativity, but still be, you be able to use all the science and the knowledge that comes with that. But I suppose also it's much more person centered that way, you know, that you're not trying to squish a person into this one mold and uh, that that might be evidence based, but yeah. doesn't suit them for whatever reason, you know, because yeah. as someone could have seven aces and I could have seven aces and they manifest very differently in us and, you know, um, also focusing on strengths, I suppose, as you, you say, is yeah. so important. Yeah. Um, um, but I find that when people do get this information, um, they can become more curious about their own coping strategies, you know, even mm -hmm. if it involves addiction or, or, or depression, that they can kind of restory how they've coped right. um, in, in a positive way, maybe, mm -hmm. you know, or, or they can some of the self-blame and shame shifts a little bit when they realize in some ways they are typical of statistics if you get me you know there is right. the individual yeah. but it's not just them they're not the only one right absolutely and that's the thing is when we talk about community we talk about collective yeah um I, in the past couple of years i've gotten uh, you know everybody talks about self-care and i still use those words of self-care but i'm starting to shift my language to self-compassion okay and um, and then collective care, right? And being able to rely on people. And we live in a generation where, or in a society now, I mean, I grew up in a generation where we didn't have the communication through social media. And um, while there are great benefits to it, there are huge challenges to it. And it keeps away from our interpersonal. Right now, social media and um, technology are the best thing that could ever happen because we don't, we can't be near each other. Yeah. But but prior to that, it, you know, and again, we have to start talking about the early childhood, the, the developmental years, the teenage years, where are we seeing most of our, you know, uh, maladaptive behaviors really beginning? And it's in the, the old, you know, young teen, preteen years and, and, you know, whether it's, it's, it's body image issues, it's peer issues, there's just so many pieces that go there. And then we have adults that didn't grow up in that generation. They're like, just suck it up, move on. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it don't take it personally. Don't, you know, it, it, their coping is like, okay, I'm just denial. gonna press it. right, deny, right. It's not just a river, right? <laughs> and if it's like press it down, don't don't pay attention to it. And I was brought up that way. Mm. Like you don't tell people what's going on at home. You don't do this, you don't do that. However, because I mean you can already pick up on this, I can't I tend to be very energized and active and but out in public, be that and then come home and then like shut it down because you need to like, you know, it's too much. So um it's, you know, this is a, it, my work in, in, it, and I say this in anything, we, a lot of us choose our, our work because of stuff that's happened to us or because we want to make something different or accepted. And um, yeah, I see, I'm going to go off on it. I'm just going to go off. I'm just going to keep talking. That's okay. <laughs> that, but, but I mean, that's yeah. true. Everyone in a way knows that, or that many helping professionals um, are motivated you know, by, by something they've experienced and, and right. want to do good in the world. Right. Um, but then sometimes our systems make that difficult for them, you know, mm -hmm. or they, the, the systems can be traumatizing in and of themselves. And even the education system, you know, oh. you mentioned the, yeah. um, the preoccupation with results and, yeah. and academics not understanding neurodevelopment and that you have to be safe and regulated to actually learn yeah. i mean that's yeah. doing kids a huge disservice i think yeah um, it it drives me nuts it yeah. absolutely drives me nuts and you know um i yeah yeah the, it, that's a whole other conversation <laughs> about how we but you know and i think one of the things that that i think part of my purpose of, uh, in my work is um you know getting back to the to the bridge between policy and practice is 
um, you know, and you've mentioned it a couple of times around the embodiment work is really making that more acceptable and, and investing in that as, you know, um, a lot of uh, embodiment work is not necessarily, um, what's the word I'm looking for, researched enough that it's, it's, it's considered, you know, that we can pay for it through insurance or whatever. It's yes. starting to get there. It's starting to get there, but it's still not enough. Like we have so much that we need to, to do. And I, I would love nothing more that, you know, policy becomes that, you know, an insurance company will pay for, um, you know, uh, movement therapy versus yeah. a sit down and talk therapy. Like I can't sit still, still for hours upon hours. I struggle with that, but mm -hmm. I've learned to teach myself different breathing exercises and movements that is going to help center me, ground me, or regulate me. So, and it's getting back to what we originally talked about. And it also helps build relationship with self and others. Yeah. Um, I'm aware that you're a yoga teacher and um, Bessel van der Kolk, I did some training with him before as well and, and, and read his book. And I found it so interesting that he said yoga is one of the best mental health interventions that there is. Would you, would you agree? And what do you think is most special about it? Why is it um, so effective and good for people? Yeah, so, so the reason that I got into yoga was because um, somebody said like, this will help calm you down. I've learned to pace my, my speaking, my, my breathing. Um, somebody that knew me way before I did became a yoga teacher was like, oh, I can understand what you're talking about now because you're not speaking at a million miles per hour. And I'm like, okay, thank you. Um, so there's a piece to that. But um, the first time I got on my mat and in a class, I had a full blown panic attack. Oh, really? And it was, it was, it was intense. So, but I, I went to the teacher and they said, you know, this was too much. The teacher said, let's get you in a smaller class. Let's do this. And then um, I never saw myself becoming a yoga teacher. Uh, the reason I became a yoga teacher was because the community that I was practicing yoga in, the, the teacher training, you actually have to do, so everybody thinks yoga, they think breathing and they think these poses. Yoga is so much more. There's like so many parts to yoga. And one of the pieces was seva or seva. I don't know how they, everybody says it differently, which means of service. Okay. So, so I got to go to Malawi, Africa. And wow. And part of building a school. But that experience like taught me what it looks like in a community in a different world. And, and, you know, being able to be in a country where there's no running water, no electricity for two entire weeks, I came back the least anxious I've ever been in my entire life. And it was amazing to think that, but it's because I had to sit with myself and sit with my body and sit with my breathing and just be like, okay with this. I think that that's where yoga can be really, really helpful. Some people are like, I'm not flexible. I'm too scared. I don't want to sit with my thoughts, all those things. Totally get it. You don't have to do yoga just that way. There's so many other ways you can do the, the pieces around yoga, which is, you know, the body mind connection, the word mm -hmm. yoga means yoke, right. Or union. And so it's mm -hmm. connecting everything. So, um, yeah, that's the down and dirty for me for yoga. It's like, Hey, I'm just going to get on my mat. I'm going to sit for a few minutes. I'm going to do a few poses. And I'm going to set an intention and then I'm on my way for my day. And then I'm practicing yoga and everything else I do, which is I'm, I'm breathing. I'm, I'm trying to stay centered, but I'm also of service to others and building that community. Yeah, that's really interesting because I hadn't heard that about the, the, the community element and the being of, of service, but it does, it, it does uh, make sense. Although it seems somewhat lost in the uh, modern era where yoga has been sort of commercialized and yep. becomes quite expensive and is yep. about the bendiness and, and yeah. stuff. Do you, do you um, bring it in with your, your little students at all? Do you teach them bits and bobs of yoga? Yeah, yeah, I do. And that's the, the fun part is um, I teach, uh, like I did yes, the other day is I did the love and kindness meditation. Um, you know, and it, it, it talks about may, you know, it, it kind of goes like, may I be happy? May I be free? May I be safe? Those kinds of things. And then saying, may you be, or may the, the world be. And if you can get little nuggets into one person, it's like, I don't know. I had one kid jump in and say, I don't, I was, I was saying something about like, I was distracted by something. And the kid was like, I'm totally weird and I love being weird. I'm like, yes, let's be weird. You know, like, something <laughs> yeah, like that and being like, I'm all over the place and I, you know, I'm not going to pretend to be something I'm not. And, and just being able to teach somebody that, and if they can use that little tool, that little nugget 
And then 15 years down the road, they're graduating high school or, or, or college. And they're like, I remember this one little piece. This is what kept me, kept me grounded or kept me rooted. And um, it's giving little bits of information that are digestible when someone is in crisis and mm -hmm. being able to tap it. But you have to practice, practice, practice to get the brain to absorb it, the mind to absorb it, to get the body to absorb it. Um, I forget who originally said it. I feel like I think I heard it from a yoga teacher named Nikki Myers, but the issues are in the tissues, right? And yeah. I'll tell kids that all the time. And I'm like, and I'm like, what do you think that means? They're like, uh, I have a Kleenex in me. I'm like, no, <laughs> everything that happens to us happens in our bodies and yeah. it stays with us. You know, how do we learn to accept it? How do we change things? You know, like certain things that, that we can change. And, um, you know, a part, I, I, I've been doing a lot of work around DBT, dialectical behavioral okay. therapy. And that incorporates, you know, the mindfulness piece, the distress tolerance, but just kind of how do we make it all work within, within ourselves and um, that balance of acceptance and change, acceptance and change. That's like such, they're so opposites, but they're not, they all work together. Yeah, I started doing coherent breathing um, last year with Dick Brown and uh, Pat Gerberg, and I really loved it and had some quite unusual uh, sensations while doing the two-day training and also movement medicine um mm -hmm. uh, there's a, a woman or there are a few who do it in cork and it is kind of amazing you know again to to feel things crack that you didn't even know or or, or a bit of a tension release or just yep. the energy and i think we have become quite disconnected from our bodies or we're we're interested in going to the gym but not we don't really we don't really tune in to what's going on for us because we're so busy, I guess, and so used yeah. to stress. Um, yeah. That's a, that is a really big piece that I am a huge proponent of movement therapy, whatever it is, if it's exercise, it's running, it's whatever. But I want, I, my hope for the world is that people start to incorporate the mindfulness piece while they're doing it. Um, I, I can't stand running. Like I hate it. I will hike and walk forever and ever and ever, but the actual part practice of running, which I've done five Ks and stuff like that. I'm like, I just get so in my head, but not in the, the part of my head. That's like, you know what? Just pace your breathing, do this. You're almost done. Nope. I'm like having a war within my head. Like this is the worst thing ever. I can't do this, but I can sit on a mat and just lay down and, and breathe. So it's a, it's, you know, it's just accepting like, Hey, running may not be my thing, but I like to move around those kinds of things. So yeah, yeah, but the movement piece is so important is getting that energy out of your body. Yeah, and I, I just, again, I think it's poorly understood and I think medics maybe don't understand it, you know, mm. so there's, there's such a wide range of educating, like you say, what a great idea if insurance companies would cover some of these alternative mm -hmm. techniques for people, because if they have to pay a lot of money, it's just not possible for, for lots of people. They'll go no, with what will be covered. Right. And that's what for, for, I, you know, again, we have very different um, health systems, you know, between the UK and, and uh, the, the U S but um, even paying for high quality mental health, um, you know, it, it, the, the burnout rate for um, providers that provide for Medicaid, you know, the people that won't, cause they're so stressed, they're, the, the patients are not going to show up all the time and they're going to cancel last minute. And then you don't get paid or reimbursed or, mm -hmm any of that stuff. I mean, it's a, it's a really sad state of like that. We, we can't provide equal and equitable, um, services and supports to people and really give them a lift up to say like, Hey, you have a fair chance at, at this game we call life. Mm. Yeah, indeed. Um, well, we're, we're nearing the end um, here, and I've learned an awful lot. Uh, you do fascinating work across so many and such such a wide range of experiences. But you mentioned Wendy Ellis there and her her focus um, on on equity, I suppose, and the um, building community resilience model. And what I think is very interesting about it as well is that unless I suppose this goes to some of the social studies criticisms of just the original ACES framework that if you don't bring in the wider social and structural context and look at racism and those type of things that we're, 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 we're missing out on a lot of um, important stressors in people's lives. Um, 
do you think that 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 that's true that this is an important dimension to kind of growing um the aces and trauma movement and making it more relevant and accessible to people absolutely um you know it it again it's something that i'm still working and learning and 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 going through um and i said it earlier like you know it it it, it really does show up you know with the the oppressor the the oppression that has happened in not only our country but in other countries too right sure. like um and and being able to speak to that and not be afraid of like um it i had this conversation with somebody not too long ago is that like i work really hard at trying to figure out to better understand my white culture mm. so that you know as part of the oppressive and the oppressed or, or i mean oppressive systems mm. and at, at what point do you know how much change how much work can i keep you know keep doing and this is a lifelong process. I'm probably, you know, it, it hopefully live to 90 years old, but I will still have things that are innately in me and what I've grown up around. And how do I continue to, to work on that? But we, these are conversations that have to be had. And it does start with understanding that, you know, the trauma, the, 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 the aces, whatever, whatever people relate to mm -hmm. is, it is so deep rooted with um around you know race and and gender and equality and equity and they're all i would say inequality and inequities like it, it's not to say there's doom and gloom there is hope it's just a matter of like it it we need to it, i don't know I, i'm 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 in a in a place right now i'm like all right my head's running a million miles an hour and i these are the things that i would see that would be helpful but it's having more conversations with people that look like me to say like we need to start doing more work yeah. And, and paying attention to that, you know, the, the people that are oppressed, that were oppressed, that are feel oppressed, or, you know, or we acknowledge that, that so much trauma and harm has been done to them, that they can rest a little bit while we do some work. Sure, yeah. I interviewed um, a woman called Fritzi Horstman, who's involved with the Compassion Prison Project, which is a really cool thing that brings a circle into prisons and teaches um, inmates about uh, adversity and trauma. And it was the, it was around the day of well, it was after the George, George Floyd murder, but around the time that there was the incident in Central Park, you know, with the, mm -hmm. the man watching the birds and yep. things were really in, getting inflamed. But what was so interesting was I think it kind of it appeared to dawn on white America then and also white people the world over. My yeah. God, this is what people are dealing with this mm -hmm. type of aggression and lack of safety in their bodies around some white people. Um, yeah. And, um, you know, the, 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 the videos of police brutality and all of that. Um, do you think, I mean, you mentioned law enforcement there earlier and how trauma training had to be tweaked. It strikes me that law enforcement officers though are traumatized themselves often you know it's a, mm -hmm. it's it, because of gun violence in america the mm -hmm. streets are very dangerous and mm -hmm. and um again being in survival mode cuts you off from thinking through consequences and you know you might respond far too quickly mm -hmm. but um would you be hopeful that we can we can shift this somehow. I mean, I, I don't know how it can be done without getting rid of guns, really, because it's we're we're a whole pile more safe here because we don't have them. And and while we have problems with policing, it's mm -hmm. not like that. You know, it's there's not the the fatal violence mm -hmm. um, or shooting as a first resort. Mm -hmm. Do do you think though that again learning about trauma and learning about interpersonal neurobiology and and those type of things needs to be kind of part of the core curriculum almost for for police officers? Yes, and mm -hmm. we also need to talk about what um, good mental health looks like because, like you said, that a lot of law enforcement you know have their own traumas. And again, I'm going to go back to it's a helping profession, mm -hmm. you know, or it's seen as a helping profession or it's supposed to be is that we, you know, again, we choose 
or we, we go the path of thinking we're going to help people in this way. And when you have power and, and that, and you're, you're dysregulated, mm -hmm. this is the, what we see Toxic is what's happening. Combo. Right. And then to put a weapon, a readily available weapon, you know, there, I don't know if you, uh, you may not have heard, I mean, because it's, it's like an everyday situation here, but we actually recently had something happen in Philadelphia where a, a, um, a man was, was, uh, family had called 911 a couple of times um, to address his mental health. And um, it, it was on video and the, the, you know, the mom was right behind him trying to like, just get the police to like, you know, help settle him down. And unfortunately, and um, I, almost not shockingly, but they pulled their guns out and they shot him to death and killed them. And, you know, there's a lot of controversy um, uh, the, and and talk about getting social workers and and psychologists and and mental health professionals to be riding along with police officers. And while personally, I think that could be a good thing. I also think that could be a really challenging thing based on our ethics as social workers. Right. And you know, that's it, it's a really fascinating discussion to be part of and listening to and having. And um, right now, I'm just in the phase of continuously listening, 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 and trying to figure out a way that I can be part of, of that change where it's sitting with my ethics and, and sure. my, my hopes. And um, I don't know, I, 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 there's parts of me that are always hopeful and optimistic, but there's also parts of me that are finally becoming more realistic about certain <laughs> right. things. And, you know, I'm like, oh man, I can't still live in my, my ideal, like unicorns exist world, um, you know, but it's, yeah, it's hard. And I, and that's the one thing I wish. And, and I, I've had a gun once in my life, just at a gun range and I will never touch a gun again. And it just, for me, it just was so unsettling. And to, to, to work in a hospital where I saw gunshot victims, children, teenagers, like it's, we need to remove them. Like there's no reason for them. And, you know, and, but then again, we live, we're in a country where we are, everything's based on our power and our rights. Yes. Yeah. Well, it, again, as a mom of small children, uh, I'm married to an American, yeah. your gun ownership and the fact that you've, you know, shootings in schools would be one thing that would, aside from the previous four years, would be um, something that would make me slow to move to the States because we don't have to worry about shootings here, you know, and that's, that's kind of nice not to be fearful of our fellow humans at that level and think that we need to arm ourselves with them but um what area of public policy it's a it's a tough question because there's so much in need of change but what one or two things um in your state or in your country would you like to see work on work on and focus on over the next little while erin so um, my number one thing would be around social emotional learning. And while our schools are definitely incorporating it, it's still not, you know, um, enough um, that I'm going to give you three. So the social emotional learning at the early ages, uh, like in, in K through 12, as we put it here, primary, secondary schools and um, in college or university or, you know, uh, post-grad or whatever, um, I do think that we provide more information around trauma-informed care um, in all sectors. Okay. Um, and, and then my third would be around guns and, right. and, and you know, uh, the gun laws and um, the types of guns that are available. And um, actually, I'm going to throw a fourth one in there, too, is the idea of mental health, you know, uh, someone struggling with mental health issues um, and being put in prison because of, you know, whether they have an addiction and they had drug use or... Um, don't get me wrong. I do think that people need to be held accountable for certain things, but I do believe that our, we are a, um, a society that our prisons are for profit and let's invest would they invest people invest in them way more than they invest in education and mental yeah. health than than is what's good for us and mm -hmm. for the world. Mm -hmm. And which of those do you think is most doable in the short term? Um, if we get, which I'm hoping, and I'm pretty sure we might, um, is get the right um, secretary of education in place because our new vice president elect's um, wife is an educator. Um, it would really be incorporating more um, uh, social workers in schools. Um, 
therapist, uh, mental health pieces, um, and social emotional learning as the curriculum along with, and because we were talking about this earlier, is around um, talking about history, what history looks like, not just for white people. Mm. So, and getting that curriculum into the history pieces. So I think that's highly important and would be my priority. Um, and I think that we can, that builds on prevention of yeah. future, future things. Erin Connolly, thank you so much. I've, I've really enjoyed chatting to you and have, um, well, I always learn an awful lot from these conversations, you know, but hearing about the, the range of work you've done and just um, the role of social work in schools, I think it's fascinating, you know, what it can be and the various modalities that you use and can draw on. It's, it is very creative and person-centered and then being on the board of CTIP, I wonder when you get in some sleep, you know, it's, it's, oh, it's, it's a full. Good. It's yeah. all good. <laughs> okay. It's like everybody else, right? You, you figure it out, you make it happen. So, but well, thank, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much for, for inviting me to chat with you. And um, it's always good, you know, like I get nervous at the beginning and then I'm like, whew, I'm like just in a conversation. And that's um, all it is. You that's made it, all you it is. So wonderful. And it's, yeah, it's just good to even keep thinking about the work that, that I'm doing and what I hope to do. So thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. My pleasure. This has been uh, Jane Mulcahy with Erin Connolly and How to Talk Policy and Influence People. Take care now.